I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we meet tonight, the Bunwurrung and Woiwurrung people of the Kulin Nation, and pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging. I acknowledge that sovereignty of this land has never been ceded. The Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples have resisted the invasion and occupation of their lands for over 200 years and continue to do so until today. In today's society, there is an enormous emphasis on living longer, living healthy, and some would say most importantly, looking young for as long as possible. Bucking this trend, the topic of tonight's presentation is why die young between wellness and illness is stillness. It will focus on issues that affect people's lifespans and in particular, why some people die young. Are there any ways in which we can prevent death at a young age? We have two distinguished speakers this evening. Our guest speaker will be Professor Mark Cohen, who is one of Australia's pioneers of integrative and holistic medicine. He is Professor of Health Sciences at RMIT University, has degrees in Western medicine, physiology and psychological medicine, and PhDs in Chinese medicine and electrical and computer systems engineering. He is currently the chair of the Austra Australasian Wellness Association and a board member of the Global Wellness Summit. Professor Cohen has also published more than 80 peer-reviewed articles, 20 books and monographs, 15 book chapters, and that's just the tip of the iceberg. First though, I'd like to call upon Rabbi Label Wolf to introduce this evening's topic from a Jewish spiritual perspective. Rabbi Wolf is the founder of Spirit Grow and has recently come back from a lecture tour of the USA and Canada. In March, he has been invited to be the scholar in residence in South Africa for the Chief Rabbi's Sinai in Daba program. Rabbi Wolf. Thank you very much, Rebecca. Good evening, everybody. And a very, very special welcome to Mark Cohen. Mark reminded me that it's probably been a decade since he first began to be a guest lecturer here. And he has done so every year, bar one. And I want to say how deeply indebted we are to him because he doesn't have to come here but because of his concern and regard for our institution and it's a mutual admiration society, as a consequence, we're very, very fortunate in being able to welcome him here this evening once again. Thank you so much, Mark. Before those words of wisdom and important words of research come and meet our ears, I'd like to share with you just a few thoughts about some Jewish spiritual perspectives. Because after all, that's the raison d'etre of our existence here as spirit grow. In a sense, we're integrative in the same way as Professor Cohen's work is. We take the physical and the spiritual and we try to understand the unity of both. One of the things that we constantly see, both in nature and in thought processes, is that the probable litmus test for happiness, for fulfillment and the like, is summarized in the word connectedness. Whether it be connectedness in terms of relationships, whether it be connectedness in terms of knowledge, all forms of taking separation, which we call pirud, and creating achdut, echad, oneness. Because in our system, ultimately, everything is part of oneness. And if we can discover that interrelationship, we're getting closer to the truth, whatever that might be. In fact, uh, you and I both have heard that the quest in all areas of human endeavor and knowledge and science in particular is to find the one elegant equation that is able to provide the understanding of oneness in all things. 
So one of the most unfortunate states which opposes states of oneness, disconnectedness, is death and dying on a number of levels. Firstly, it's a disconnection of the spiritual energy which courses through our body and the body as such. And more profoundly, emotionally, it's a disconnectedness between ourselves and dear departed ones at both of these levels. The fact that we're a, uh, we are a duality is self-evident. You have eyes, you have ears. When a person dies, at least for the first few seconds later, when decomposition is not really evident, nevertheless the eyes do not see and the ears do not hear notwithstanding that physiologically they're totally intact. Which means it's not the machinery called body that ultimately does the connecting. It's the energy which flows through the machinery of the body that creates the meaningfulness of life as such in the process of connection. The brain itself is a complex piece of machinery, but only machinery as such if it were not for this state of energy flow, which we call neshama, call it by any terms that you want, our minds would not be cogitating, intellectualizing, thinking, imagining, and the like. So the idea of the disconnection of these two is something which is very, very profound, as I said, at a physiological level and both at a relational level. I guess the question is, why do we die? Should we not be able to continue living forever? You would say, but it's obvious that we wind down. What does it mean we wind down? <coughs> the soul, we say, is ageless. The soul is also perfect. The energy system doesn't wind down. Somehow, the machinery that facilitates it winds down. However, one of the major teachings in our tradition is that we have to have profound respect for that machinery, that it's an absolute mitzvah to maintain health and wellness. No less a mitzvah than any other, whether that be keeping kosher or Shabbos or what have you, or the so-called religious mitzvot. Keeping healthy is on par with all of them, although many people, even within the Jewish tradition, are not aware that it's got parity in that respect. It's very, very important. So one of the things that we have to do is look after ourselves, keep the machinery well-oiled. Once upon a time in an agriculturally based society, which was for the majority of history, this was fairly simple because we learnt the skills of self-maintenance because they were self-propelling from generation to generation. Foodstuffs were the same. Lifestyles were the same. Today, in a very short space of time of 60, 70, 80 years, we've radically altered our lifestyles. We've radically altered the food we eat. And as a consequence of these two alone, and there are others, radical changes have begun to become affected in our bodies, and not all of them good. I'm not the expert in that arena, but I think it's self-evident that the kind of toxicity that unfortunately we imbibe crosses the threshold of our tolerance, resulting in illness, various forms of illness. And medical science tries to determine the correlation between which illness and which piece of toxicity, which piece of body malfunction and the like. But the fact nevertheless remains that it is. So I guess the adage that from the moment we're born, we begin to die is perhaps accelerated in our own day and age, unfortunately. Having said that, I want to tackle the question just momentarily of something that's quite tragic, and that is that people are dying prematurely, even children. One wonders where is divine justice in context of something like that. 
So let me introduce a concept which is not unknown to you. The idea that our lifetime is but one of many. And this concept isn't just intrinsically Jewish. It holds true in many a spiritual tradition. The Tibetan book of death and dying testifies to another tradition that speaks about it in a very profound way and teaches that there is an approach to dying which is spiritual per se, likewise in the Jewish tradition. But that doesn't explain the disconnectedness of parent and young child or anyone who seems to die prematurely. We could wax philosophically on this and we shan't, but perhaps I can add the following point. The journeys, the reincarnative journeys, Gilgul Hanefesh in the Hebrew, is part and parcel of our evolution and development as our own singular personality. And in each lifetime, we're provided with further and different opportunities to express that. We're given a different body. We're given a different set of parents. We're given a different set of environmental circumstances. We're given a different genetic makeup. And all these variables mean that we are essentially different on the outside. But somehow or other, on the very inside, whatever that might mean, it's the same essence. Sometimes the journey has to end because there's no further need for the giftedness of that soul to make any further contribution. Its journey is over, maybe after the 10th lifetime, 20th lifetime, we don't know. And when that moment is due, no matter what the age of the body, no matter what the age of the machinery, the neshama returns, the energy returns to its source. And the parents or the family or the close loved ones have to recognize that that becomes a moment in which the guardianship has been completed and our duty to such an extent has been completed. Doesn't make it any less sad, doesn't make it any less difficult. But at least at an intellectual level, there's some level of understanding, even if the emotions don't match the intellect in the moment as such. Another very interesting concept is that of a doctor. Because if we were to be very uh, uh, basic in our thinking, should we not say, if a person is ill, then that's probably divine will, and who are we to interfere with divine will as such? So the Torah instructs us otherwise, and says that it's an absolute mitzvah, as I said earlier, to be healed and to be healthy. One further point, the same Torah tells us that the doctor is the conduit for the flow of blessings that create health and wellness. It's not necessarily the doctor's skills, although the higher the skills, the more likely that will be accelerated the flow of health muzzle into our being. And that's why the various studies that show that a, a good bedside manner by a doctor accelerates the process of healing because he becomes a better conduit, a better channel from above as such. So always choose a doctor who is able to give you confidence. Unfortunately, Many a doctor, because of our legalistic system, especially those who do deal with uh, death and dying, all too often play the role of the Aboriginal elder who points the bone and the victim unfortunately dies. The power of suggestion is very, very strong. And therefore, if the doctor says, you have three months to live, it's very likely that they'll die on time. And that's very, very unfortunate. So the attitudinal response of the healer is terribly important. One final point. The notion which uh, Professor Cohen will probably emphasize to a large extent this evening, stillness. Let me say that everything is in a state of motion. There's no such thing as absolute stillness. That chair that you're seated on feels still, 
put it under an electron microscope. It's in a whirling dervish dance of molecules in a constant state of motion. There's no absolute stillness, but we do have relative stillness. One of the things that we unfortunately suffer in our day and age is agitation, nervousness, stress, worry, anxiousness, and the like. And that's an emotional movement that goes far beyond the norm. And that kind of agitation also creates unhealthy agitation within the body as such. And when the body malfunctions, it means that our inner essence, whoever we are, cannot express optimally. And that becomes known as illness and the like. So achieving relative states of stillness from a world that's constantly trying to tumble us about and remove our stability is a skill that each one of us has to acquire, especially in the last 60, 70 years compared to the rest of history. So with those few introductory words, I'm going to turn over the uh, mic to Professor Cohen, and I'm sure he's going to take us on one of his absolutely delightful journeys sharing with us some of the things that he may have picked up in the last year or two because he's a student forever, which is the best example for all of us. And let me say how very proud I am, Mark, that you are here with us tonight. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Label. Is that on, David? Yeah. I'm good? Well, thanks for the invitation to come back. Yeah, it's been 10 years coming here. and. Um, it's sort of fun because Label ends up giving me a topic that I adapt my past sort of knowledge and, and presentations to. And this is a really informal environment. And, and I'm always a bit um, unsure whether I just talk and not use my slides because you know, the, I've got more freedom just to talk rather than you know, just going through slides. Because um, the slides sort of dictate what you know, what the next thing I'm going to say is. But I put a lot of effort into these slides and I was sort of, and hopefully they'll illustrate some points. So what I thought I'd talk about today, and I really like the topic, you know, between wellness and illness and stillness, and, and Label's obviously, you know, heard me talk before and I have, a, have a, a, a particular slide that demonstrates that, which I will talk to today. But today what I thought I'd do is, um, and, and what I really enjoy doing is, going to, talking about first principles, like going back to the basics and giving like a theoretical perspective and then bringing that really down into the mundane, practical, what do you do with your life? How, how is this going to, you know, what, what can you do tomorrow morning that's going to that's gonna rock your world and change you know, how you feel about that life? So I'm going to hopefully achieve both of those things, give you a, some really grounding in first principles. And, and I've just been made aware that that there is a um, Spirit Grow YouTube channel that um, this will be on and, and my other presentations are on. And this presentation covers some of the material I've had in my past presentation. So I'm going to jump over some of this material, but it's, I've talked about it before and you know, there's references and you can watch that in other presentations. And I've, I'm building a website. I've got my own website, which is drmark.co.co. Um, and I've got a whole lot of content there. So, you know, I'm going to touch on some topics. I'll go into a bit more depth on others. And the stuff that I don't go in, touch on, there's places where you can look that up. So I am going to use my slides. And you're thinking about, you know, why die young? And this was a, you know, a, another topic I've been thinking a lot lately about, you know, why do we die and when do we want to die? And in medicine, I mean, I'm trained as a, a Western doctor. You know, death is sort of the enemy. You know, you try and do everything to avoid death. And um, I'm here today with my mum and my brother, and my mother is my biggest fan. She's heard me speak hundreds of times all over the world. She's, we've travelled together all over the world and um, given lots of different lectures. And she said, I can't remember what you, know, what you actually talk about. <laughs> but, but she lives it. And mum is... She, mum's, Eva is facing a health crisis. She's had melanoma for 11 years. And now it's stage four and she's got tumours growing everywhere. Liver, lung, kidneys, retroperitoneum. And you know, the doctors say she hasn't got long. 
but she's incredibly well. She's pain-free. She's on no medication. And, you know, we're talking about how does she die well? So, you know, we were talking about, you know, and it was a difficult thing for our kids to talk about with a parent, you know, that, you know, I don't want to live that long. You know, I'm ready to go. And, and what do you need for the funeral? Am I going to have a party? Well, let's have a party before I go. So this, this weekend we're having a party for Mum, which is sort of a, a celebration of her life. And, and, you know, the discussion is about dying well. And that's a discussion, I think, that is needed in our community, in our society. Because often death is seen as something to avoid, whereas it's not going to happen. It's happened to all of us. Yeah, well, she's, I think... Well, I mean, I think she's been embarrassed by that. But, but, but she, I mean, it's not that she's a survivor. She's lived incredibly well. She's the most positive person I know. I mean, she's been my biggest fan. But when I, when I was... So now I'm off topic, which is fine, because there's no slides, you see. But I grew up listening to Murray Banks. I don't know if people... In that moment, he was like positive psychology from when, you know, the, he was in the 1960s, yeah? Um, and that, you know, Mum bought... No, there were records in those days, you know? She bought the records, and I grew up listening to that. And, you know, as it happened, we ended up having dinner with Murray Banks in New York many years later. It just the way it happened. And, um, you know, Mum has been an embodiment of the stuff that I'm going to talk about. So people come and congratulate me, and, oh, you know... I'm so positive and I talk about all this great stuff. Well, I get it from my mum. But as I say, this is a... And, and the other thing I just... Before I finish... I don't want to embarrass mum too much talking about her, but um, you know, mum's never been politically active. But the only time she's ever, I've ever seen her politically active at all, and she was protesting on the steps of parliament, was about dying with dignity and a right to die. And that was after her own mother had a... who died, but actually had a... You know, quite a horrible journey through the Western medical system before that happened. So I think these are discussions, you know, why do we die, when do we die, how do we die well, how do we embrace that? I think this is a really important topic. But I'm not going to talk about that too much. I, what, what I'm going to focus on today is, is the in-between the wellness and illness is stillness and go to some of the principles um, behind that. And one of the... Um, the metaphors, the, the knowledge structures that I've been using for 30 years now is the one of five rhythms or five elements. And I, and I first studied that when I, in the mid-80s when I studied Chinese medicine. And then I studied martial arts and they used the five elements and I studied... Um, and I'm still a student of the five rhythms, which is a dance practice. And I want to share that with you as a, as a way to understand what's happening. And the, the five rhythms are really basic. It's... Flowing, staccato, chaos, lyrical, and stillness. And I, I use the fingers here because it's a really nice metaphor for understanding that. And all the transformations in nature happen according to these five rhythms. Flowing, staccato, chaos, lyrical, and stillness. And the easiest way that I've worked out to understand it is if you think, think about if in the movements of your fingers, if you're going to move with your little finger, you move like that. That's the, my little finger is leading my hand in the movement. That's flowing. If, if I'm going to move and have my ring finger lead the movement, it's like that. You know, I'll show you my ring here. That's staccato. You know, stop and start. If I'm going to have my tall finger lead the movement, I'm shaking my whole hand. That's chaos. You know, just shaking. If I'm going to have my index finger lead the movement, it's like conducting or writing or it's creative, it's lyrical. And if I'm going to have my thumb lead the movement, it's just like stillness. So you've got a little mnemonic there in your fingers to go through those rhythms. And the phases of life, and Gabriel Roth, who sort of embodied the and promoted the dance practice of five rhythms, talks about a lot of correlations with the stages of life and the stages of conception and and the parts of the body, and, and in Chinese medicine they talk about the emotions and the seasons and the body type, the body tissues, and all these things are, are correlated to these rhythms. And with the stages of life, it goes from infancy, which is flowing, and as an infant everything flows, you know, they dribble and um, you know, consciousness is flowing, and then in childhood it's staccato, which is, and in infancy it's the relationship with the mother, Childhood, it's the relationship with the father and boundaries, which is a staccato, you know, limiting thing. In adolescence, it's chaos, for 
which is sort of adolescence, but it's your relationship with your peers. Adulthood is lyrical, it's your creative phase, your relationship with society. And then old age is stillness and your relationship with the universe. So these are the natural five rhythms of a lifespan. And there's many other analogies and, uh, that'll go through the five rhythms, which I will talk about some of those. But I just thought I'd, that's a nice metaphor for, you know, the time to die is after, it's stillness. And that's a natural, you know, end of life. You know, you, you make your relationship, you make your peace with the universe and you come to the place of stillness. And then we have this, this is a, this, I mean, I use this diagram, and this diagram's been evolving with me for 30 years now, or maybe 25, um, looking at illness and wellness as a spectrum. And you divide it between the I in illness and the we in wellness. And that was um, Swami Satchinanda who actually made that distinction. You know, so wellness is the we and illness is the I. And between that you have ill health, which is below a defined line, and then you have average health in the middle. And above a other line you have enhanced health, which is less well defined because enhanced health is harder to actually define because the measures are a bit more holistic. And Western medicine, you know, which I trained in, gets people from ill health back to average. And wellness practices, complementary medicine, gets people moving up from where, wherever they are so it can create enhanced health. And the higher up you go, the greater is your flexibility of response. You can do more and you can cope with more when you're higher up on this spectrum. So you can deal with stress um, and you can also have more fun because you can actually get involved and you're more engaged with life. Also, the higher up you are, the further you've got to fall. So the best prevention is to be higher up where you're going to have more fun and you're going to be able to cope with more stress. Mind you, you're also subject to more stress because you're doing more things. Now, in the middle is this axis of homeostasis. And on the edge is the edge of homeostasis. Now, that axis of homeostasis is stillness. That's the still point in between wellness and illness. And I'm going to keep coming back to what is this axis of homeostasis. We all have that axis within us. It's the point that you achieve stillness during meditation. It's the point that it's a part of you that's immortal. It's the part of you that when I say namaste, I honour the place in you where the entire universe resides, the place of love, truth and bliss. And when I'm in that place in me, you're in that place in you, we are one. That's the place of stillness. Stillness for you is the same as stillness for me. And when you're in stillness and I'm in stillness, we're both the same. So how do we explore that? And that's, I'm going to go through that a bit more. So with this axis of homeostasis, you have this balanced state of bliss. And... When I studied you know, physiology, we talked about homeostasis as being the constant internal environment. Your body's always trying to ma maintain constant blood pressure and blood sugar and body temperature. And I'm going to talk about some of those issues there. So you have this, this balanced state, the, 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 this axis. Either side of that, you have a steady state, a comfort zone, which, are, which is where you can cope with things quite comfortably. You know, you're not outside your range of coping. You don't have to do that much. You can be comfortably on the couch, you know, there's food nearby. Then you've got the adaptation or growth zone, where you actually have to get out and do something and actually expand your ability to actually cope with what's going on. And outside that, you have this breakdown or panic zone, where you can't cope with it, and if you, get, if, you, know, if you go that wide, you're going to either collapse or, or you, can, you can rise up. Now, there are things we call stressors that take us out, and usually they take us out and they take us too far, you drop down. And there are bliss sores that move us towards bliss, that bring us in. And between them, and on this very edge, is this tipping point. And that's right at the edge of, you know, you haven't broken down and panicked, but you're right at the edge of what you can cope with. And at that point, you can actually rise up. Or you can fall down. So it's that point's a bit chaotic. It's, you know, it's, that's this tipping point of what, what can actually happen at that point. And I want to talk about the difference between that tipping point at the edge of what you can cope with and stillness, which is you're not coping with anything because you're actually doing nothing, and how you can play between these extremes. And that's what I'm going to sort of focus on. And this is going to bring in some of the the, the topics I'm really passionate about at the moment, which, which I will talk about. So th this idea that the greatest movement comes from the stillest point. 
Because you can only be at that tipping point when you're still in touch with your stillness. If you're not in touch with your stillness and you're on the edge, you're gonna, you're gonna, that, that, that stillness keeps you you while you're coping with stuff. So the greatest movement comes from the stillest point, but it happens on the edge. So when you connect with your centre, you can actually get the biggest transformation. You know, and, it's, and it's like, I think in popular culture, you know, it's, it's James Bond who can be totally still and calm and cool with all this chaos that's going around, you know. Or you know, it's the hero, that's who you aspire to be. You know, the one who can be calm, cool and collected when no one else is, you know, chaos is going on and no one else knows what to do, but you're just connected with your still point and then you can, oh, I can just work out what needs to be done. Whereas if you're freaking out, you, know, you, won't, you won't know what to do. So it's how can we be connected with that still point and not freak out when all this stuff's going on around us, you know, the tornado's happening. So how do we find our centre in life? How do we find that still point? And I've been inspired by my brother here and saying, go with the flow. And this is actually a photo of Elbert. <laughs> this is my brother on a wave at Winky Pop. Um, so he's a big wave surfer, but the idea of going with the flow, and this is a psychology term, the idea of flow, and it's a joyous, self-forgetful involvement through concentration, which is made possible by discipline of the body. So the idea of flow is your body and your mind are totally on the same page doing one thing. And that's what happens on that very edge. Because on that very edge of what you can cope with, you need your whole mind and your whole body to be absolutely engaged. You know, there's no room to worry about what's happening tomorrow, what's for lunch, or what did someone say to me, or what, who's jealous of who, because you're totally in the moment, fully as a, as a one single being doing whatever you're doing. So how do you find flow? And there, there's a lot of different metrics, but one, one is if you look at the challenges on one axis and skills on the other. As your challenge, if your skills are low and your challenges are low, you just ap- there's nothing to do and you're pretty apathetic. If your skills are low and your challenges are a bit high, you get worried. And then if, if your skills are low and your challenges are high, you get anxiety and then you panic. If your skills are medium and your challenges are medium, you know you can be bored or you know, the challenges are high, you get aroused. If your skills are high and your challenges are low, you're relaxed. Skills get higher in control, but when your skills and your challenges meet each other that's when you get flow. To get flow, you actually need to be challenged. And one of the issues in today's society is we don't challenge ourselves. Or we challenge ourselves in ways that don't engage our body. We challenge ourselves in ways of, you know, we've got to deal with all these emails and, you know, all this other stuff that's going on, but we're actually not challenging our body. And that's one of the big topics I want to talk about. is how do we consciously challenge our body that we're in control and we're highly aroused and we can actually meet this idea of flow so our body and our mind are are together, but we've totally engaged our body. And this brings me to my favourite topic, which has become my favourite topic. It's always been my favourite topic, but now I'm making it academic, which is water, which is the ultimate solution for everything, literally and, and figuratively. So I want to talk about water in many aspects, and we've only got an hour or so, so I can't talk everything on because this is a, a huge topic. But I'm going to um, introduce this idea of, of we are water. And it's not just we're water, we're water at a particular temperature. In fact, we're, we're not just water, we're, we're what I call intelligent jelly. And if you look at water on Earth, and I'm actually writing a story at the moment called The Story of Water, which is a four and a half billion year old story of how water came to Earth and how it created us. And it started, and I mean, we're liquid water. And the water on Earth actually, I'll tell you a little bit of the story, but it actually started when the hottest water in the solar system met the coldest water in the solar system. And this is four and a half billion years ago when the, when the Earth was forming and the hottest water in the solar system was in the forming Earth and the ingredients for water were there, but it was like mixed in with lava and super hot. So it wasn't liquid water, it was vapour that was mixed in the, with the molten Earth. And the coldest water in the solar system was out past Neptune in these ice comets, these carb, you know, carbonaceous chondrite comets, nearly absolute zero in the outer, outer reaches of space. And these comets all came to the Earth in this 
period they called the late heavy bombardment, which created, made the craters on the moon, and it, and it brought all these comets, these frozen ice comets, hitting the Earth, and that's what brought a lot of the water to Earth. So then this water you know, melted and sizzled up and went into the atmosphere and eventually rained down, and, and we had, now had this wet planet that we live on. And if you think about water, um, and actually, the, the reason why water can be liquid on Earth is because Earth is in this Goldilocks zone. It's not too hot, not too cold. If it was a bit closer to the sun, we'd be like Venus and be super hot. If a bit further away, we'd be like Mars and be freezing cold. And the other thing, the, the Earth has a magnetic field, and that protects the water on Earth from the solar wind. So it doesn't, or the water just doesn't get, you know, blown away from the from the solar wind. So we're in this very sp special planet on a very special distance from the sun, protected by this magnetic force field that's keeping the liquid water able to be liquid. And if we think about water on Earth, I mean, all life is bathed in water, and if that's the size, of, if the Earth was the size of a basketball, all the water on Earth would be the size of a ping pong ball. Not a lot. That's, you know, that's the water that covers all the oceans. I mean, the Earth's solid, so you know, it's, a, it's a big difference. But that, most of that water is salt water. It's in the oceans, 96.5%. You know, so the fresh water on Earth is actually the size of a small marble, if the Earth was the size of a basketball. But most of the fresh water on Earth is either in the ground, in groundwater, or it's locked up in ice caps. The liquid fresh water on Earth is that little dot there. It's the size of a mustard seed. So that's the liquid fresh water. That represents all the ocean, or all the, sorry, not the oceans, but all the lakes, all the rivers, all the streams, all the living things on Earth, which are water. Now, you know, I've sort of known that intellectually, and I'm, I'm still learning about the wonders of water, and I want to share some of that with you. And one of my inspirations was meeting Grandma Agnes Baker Pilgrim. Now, Grandma Agnes Baker Pilgrim is the chairwoman of the 13 Indigenous Grandmothers' Council. She's 93 years old, she's a, um, from North Dakota, and she's, and she's spent her whole life talking about giving voice to the voiceless, talking about water. And she says, you know, water should be everyone's concern. Without water, we all die, all life dies. Water is precious. I pray that whoever sees this, that you two will take care of your Mother Earth wherever you live, and you'll care for the water that surrounds you and the water that, that is within you. So she spent her whole life talking about water and t meeting her f a few times now and talking with her. It's, you know, it, it, you know, and because she's, she represents the Indigenous wisdom on Earth, she's the chairwoman of the, 13, um, the ca International Council of 13 Indigenous Grandmothers. And, and most Indigenous people will tell you about the value for water. And the other thing I've only learnt recently, I was at a, I was at a conference on the, with, with Mum, of course, we did a five-week tour of Europe was a year or two ago. We went to Bulgaria and Hungary and Germany and Austria and Czech Republic. Um, but I was speaking at the, the International Conference on the Physics, Chemistry and Biology of Water. It was a water conference. And it was a serious physics, chemistry and biology of water. And I met this guy, Gerald Pollack, and he taught me that we're actually 99% water. I always thought we were 70% water, and we are 70% water by volume or by mass. But if you count the number of molecules in your body, 99 out of every 100 molecules in your body are water molecules. And that's because all the other molecules are massive. You know, a protein is massive, a carbohydrate, you know, a collagen molecule is massive. And what are they dissolved in? They're dissolved in water. So for every one molecule, you've got 100 water molecules around it. So we're actually 99% water. So how come we're not a puddle on the floor? As I say, we're intelligent jelly. <laughs> we're, you know, we're, we're sort of solid water. And Gerald Pollack, um, there he is there, he talks about the fourth phase of water. He's famous for this, and he's a hard-nosed scientist at the University of Washington, and he's written books and, and published many academic articles on this fourth phase of water. And he talks about how you know, there's ice, you know, which is solid, and there's water, liquid water that we all know, and there's water vapour. There's also this gel phase. They call it exclusion zone water. And in this jelly phase of water, it, water excludes salt, <coughs> and it forms a structure. And in fact, in that structured water, and it happens at the edge of membranes, it happens at the edge of materials, water forms this structure. And in this structure, water's not H2O, it actually forms a structure that's H3O2. 
just because of the molecular arrangement. And that's what we're made out of. We're not made out of H2O, we're made out of H3O2, which is this structured water, and that's why we're not you know, a puddle on the floor. So that's one of the, the first principles. Now, the other basic principles that I want to... You know, very briefly touch on, I've talked about it before, are the laws of thermodynamics. And, the, the and these are the basic laws of all Western science. And the first law said that matter and energy cannot be created or destroyed, but only transferred or converted from one to the other. It basically says, as you know, in Judaism, that everything is one. You can't add to it and you can't subtract from it. Everything is one. It also says that the amount of water is fixed. I mean, you can rearrange a little bit, but you, know, you can't really change the amount of water. Now, the second law of thermodynamics says that in an isolated system, entropy or disorder always increases. And what that says is that if you have still water that's isolated, it's going to get polluted. And for water to be alive and for water to maintain, to be pure and to be clean, life relies on flowing water. So flowing water is the essence of life. And this idea of entropy or disorder as being related to disease and death is a really strong one. And again, back to first principles, when I was in you know, first year physiology, we learnt about inflammation. And you know, I was, I'm old, so I learnt about inflammation as calor, rubor, tumor, dolor, functiolatia. That's the Latin, which is heat, redness, swelling, pain and loss of function. That's what happens, you know, you cut yourself, you know, you get heat, you get redness, you get swelling, you get pain and you get loss of function. That's what happens in our bodies. But also it's what happens in the universe with entropy. If you think about entropy in the universe, you get the heat death of the universe, the expansion of the universe, which is a red shift in terms of the Doppler shift. You get um, or disease or pain, but... but you know, the universe, whether it feels pain or not, I can't say. But you certainly get loss of function. Energy goes from useful energy to useless energy. So the same things that happen in our body with disease happen in the universe with entropy when you have an isolated system. Now, we're open systems, so we, you know, we can cope with that. But what this says is, in an isolated system, and, and you know, the Earth is relatively isolated, you know, we get energy from the sun and we send stuff off, but, but the pain and pollution are inevitable. So, you know, can we avoid death? Well, maybe, but pain and pollution are inevitable. How do we deal with them? So why do we die young? Well, pain and pollution. And it's polluting our body. And, you know, I've talked about this a lot before, which is, you know, how, toxicity. And, you know, that was common wisdom, and still in some circles it is common wisdom that, that it's only the dose that makes the poison. But there's not. There's five things that make a poison. It's the type of chemical, it's the dose, but it's also the combination of chemicals or the combination of to toxic substances. It's the timing of when you're exposed and it's the individual, it's luck, in terms of who are your parents and where, where were you born and where do you live. So that's luck. And this is you know, where I'll refer to other talks and I've, you know, I've written about the ten toxic truths that everyone is affected, you know, the full extent's unknown, tiny doses have big effects, doses magnify up the food chain, windows of development are critical and the effects are epigenetic and transgenerational, cocktails are synergistic, things accumulate over our lifespan, exposure is unequal, unjust and greatest for the young, and the risk is unequal, unjust, or risk is unequal, unjust, greatest for the young, and exposure is unequal, unjust and accidents happen. Big industrial accidents, you know, so you're lucky where you live. So you can read about that in Organic Gardener magazine, free online, it's on my website, there's other talks I've given in the past, but this is, you know, this is polluting the water within us. So how do we keep ourselves clear and clean? What are some practical things we can do to reduce toxicity so we are a clear channel? And one of the things I'm going to suggest to you is this, we talked about that stillness, that centre that's inside us, that centre is pure water. Because the pure water that's in me is the same as the pure water that's in you. So how do we keep pure water in us? How do we keep this constant internal environment? And this idea of this, this stillness, this homeostasis. So how do we maintain balance in an unstable world? And this, this was a, a phrase that I memorised in 
second or third year medicine, you know, the constancy of the internal milieu or internal environment is the necessary condition for independent life. Claude Bernard said that he was the founder of physiology, a French scientist who, who considered the father of physiology. And the idea of if you're, you're being still, homeostasis requires you to be still and constant, but it requires work. So this is a friend of mine, Wim Hof. Some of you may have heard of him. They call him the Iceman. I'll talk a bit about him later. But, you know, he, he's still in that position, but it's actually taking him quite a bit of energy and effort just to stay still in that pose, yeah? And that's the same with our lives. It's a metaphor for our lives. To have that stillness within us, it takes a bit of work. Our bodies are working a long time to keep at that, that centre of us still. And you know, I talked about the five rhythms. Well, there are five elements of life. And again, this is first principles. You take water and carbon dioxide and you add sunlight and you get oxygen and glucose. That's photosynthesis. And you can reverse that. You take glucose and oxygen, you get energy and you create carbon dioxide and water and that's respiration. They're the, that's the, they're the five basic elements of life. And they're the five things we do. We drink, we do stuff, we regulate our temperature, we breathe and we eat. Now, out of all these things, you know, eating is sort of non-negotiable for most people. Breathing is sort of non-negotiable. Um, you know, doing stuff and drinking, you need to do that. But regulating our temperature is something that I'm going to talk a bit more about. Because regulating our temperature, I think we've become complacent. We live in these really comfortable... We've got central heating, we've got cars, we've got clothes. This, this was not always the case. Um, and you know, we have had this evolutionary adaptation to adapt to different temperatures, but we don't use it. So you know, we talked about being on the edge of your homeostatic capacity and being in the centre. We, we, in terms of our temperature regulation, we spend more time in the centre than we do anywhere near the edge. I mean, as adults, when was the last time you shivered? You know, literally shivered. You know, as a kid, can you remember shivering as a kid? Yeah, kids shiver. You know, they go out to the cold and they come back. I remember my brother when he was surfing when he was a kid. He, you know, he'd stay out in the water until he was blue and shivering and, and he wanted to go back out there, you know. As adults, we don't do that. We rug up. <laughs> we come inside. We turn the heater on. Um, so I want to talk a bit about temperature regulation. But these are the five basic elements of life and you can actually convert these into the five phases of nature. So, you know, you, you take energy from the sun... And this is what happens in photosynthesis, in a, in a chloroplast. These are the, the little um, organelles. They're the little organs inside plants that make glucose. And this is what happens. It takes energy, you get carbon dioxide and water. Photosynthesis happens and you get oxygen and glucose. And that makes more trees, more plant material, and you can get more energy. And this is, goes around in a cycle that builds up plant material. Well, animals do the opposite. In a mitochondria, and that's what's inside our cells, we take glucose, we add oxygen, and we get water, carbon dioxide and energy out of it, and that gives us muscle energy so we can do stuff and also makes more people, makes more, more biomass. And it's interesting, though, because we actually make our own water this way. And if you looked at that first equation, I'll go back really quickly, if you do respiration, which is that way, for every glucose molecule you burn, you make six molecules of water. So we actually make our own water inside us when we burn glucose. Often that's just considered just the matrix of the reaction, but I think that's going to start to be rethought. But this really basic chemistry reaction, it's not just about the glucose and the energy, it's actually the water that matters. So it was just a little aside there. Now, this is a big slide. I could talk for ages on it, but I want to do it really, really quickly. And these are the five rhythms of evolution. So this is a slide that represents the evolution of all life in terms of the genetics. It starts off with the, with the Earth, the birth of the Earth four and a half billion years ago. And as you go out in these circles, like the, the ripples on a pond, it's time. So the very outer edge of this pond is the current time. And that's the diversity of all... Oh, that current, that's the current diversity of life. But life started off in this primordial soup where you had... And in fact, it was where the hottest water met the coldest water again. You know, I said water on Earth happened when the coldest water from the past Neptune met the hottest water on Earth. Well, what happens in the oceans is water has all these anomalies that scientists still don't understand. 
And one is that as water gets colder, it gets denser and heavier. So, so the wa coldest water on Earth is at the very bottom of the ocean. You know, ice forms and floats in the top, but the very coldest water hits the very bottom of the ocean. That's the coldest water on Earth. It can be minus eight degrees liquid water, even colder. The hottest water on Earth is also at the very bottom of the ocean, coming out of hot springs, where the, you know, it's been superheated from the, Earth, you know, from the magma, from the Earth's crust, and it can be 400 degrees Celsius, but still liquid because of the pressure. And at 400 degrees, liquid water melts the rocks. It dissolves all the, the minerals in the rocks. So this very highly mineralised, super hot water meets this super cold water. And all this complex chemistry happens because you've got a full range of different pressure. You've got all these different chemical dissolved things inside. And that's where life originated in this primordial soup. It formed this sort of gel, the whole... It just felt like these hydrothermal vents fill the oceans with this organic chemistry soup. And eventually, and I can summarise the whole first phase, first four billion years of evolution into six words, and that's gels, cells, organelles, gender cells and shells. So just to explain that, so life started off as this primordial soup and eventually that, that got encapsulated in these bubbles of lipid and it became cells the most basic cells, prokaryotes we call them. And those prokaryotes learn how to get the hot water from photosynthesis then, from, from the sun, and produce oxygen. And then those uh, an original cells got engulfed by other cells and formed eukaryotes. And eukaryotes are like all of our cells, they have organelles. So it's gel gels, cells and organelles. So that's a cell with other little cells inside. So the mitochondria and the chloroplasts you saw before, they used to be their own organisms. They got engulfed inside other cells and became like the machinery to make glucose or to, make, to burn glucose. So our mitochondria are organelles that actually used to be their own bacteria that got engulfed. So it was gels, cells, and then organelles. And then once you had these complex cells, they learned to reproduce sexually. And there's a reason why sex is wet, because... You know, you're actually transferring this watery substance within a whole cell. And once you had sexual reproduction, you had multicellular organisms, you had this explosion of complexity. That's called the Cambrian explosion. The Cambrian explosion. So you know, once you got to sexual cells, you had this big explosion. But you can see here, then we had shells. Life got encased in shells, and shells... Shelled life includes all insects, all crustaceans, all mollusks, all shellfish. They're still the biggest class of living matter on Earth. You know, there's more insects, if you count all the massive insects and everything, it's way bigger than all the mammals and other organisms on Earth. But you can only get so complex as a shell. The shells can only get so big, and they can only get, you know, they can only interact, they can only move so far. So then the next phase, the next five rhythms of evolution. So that, that was like the flowing was the gel. gel. Staccato was the cell because it's got a barrier. Chaos was the organelles because it actually produced oxygen and, and it's sort of um, more chaotic there. Um, lyrical was the sexual cells and then shells were the, the stillness phase. The next wave of evolution came with five words, which is scales, skin, feathers, fur, and technology. We can say scale, skin, feather, fur, and fashion. And that's life getting encapsulated. So with, with that, you've got... Oh, there, oh, there, that's the, the gel cells, organelles, sexual cells, and, and shells. That's the first phase of evolution of life. And we're not going to go into that in big detail. And then we had scales, which took life all throughout the oceans. And this is vertebrate life now. So once, had, once shells got so complex, but they could not complex enough, but once the sh if you put your shell on the inside and had a vertebrae, <coughs> had a spine, it gives you a lot more mobility to then go and explore the rest of the planet and become more complex. So fish did that and they conquered the oceans, the flowing phase, and then life, vertebrate life went to land, it was covered by skin. And that's a staccato process of you know, walking and... Gabrielle Roth would say it's to do with the hips, backwards and forwards. And then life 
took to the air, which is chaotic movement, covered by feathers. And then life took everywhere. Mammals can go in the air and in the water and, and, and on the land, and, you know, covered by fur. And then the stillness phase is technology or fashion, where we can go in a car or a spaceship or an aeroplane and go anywhere we want. We use technology to, to, guide, you know, to encapsulate the water within inside us. Now, this process is not exclusive, so within us is a lot of this previous evolution. Um, so I've already said that there, you know, there's literally a well in our being. You know, a well is where you find water, yeah? And as I say, we burn glucose, we create our own water. About 400 mils, they say. Not a lot, but you know, we create about 400 mils of pure water just for our own metabolism. And if you think about this evolutionary journey of life, it's within us and on us and around us. And you've, you've heard of the microbiome, yeah? If you've heard anything in health science in the last five years, you know, they're talking about the, the microbial life that's within us, it contains more genetic material and it guides our emotions and it guides our health and our toxicity, everything. But we actually have five biomes. We have biomes in our body, on our skin. We have biomes in our bowel, which is the microbiome. We have biomes in our breath. We have biomes in our bathing water. And we have biomes in our buildings. And in fact, now that there's um, forensic um, tests where you can actually look at the microbial life in a house, on a couch or on a pillow, and you can tell who's lived there in the last 10 days based on the microbial life on that person and like, what's in the house, and you form this ecosystem within where you live. And that's, that's good enough to actually place someone at a murder scene because, hey, you know, you got, these bugs were there and you know, you're there. So, the, you know, these ancient microbial life forms are still with us. It's not like we've evolved past them. They're, you know, we've taken that with us and we're, we're, you know, little vehicles for them to get around. So it's not like the cars just drive us around, they drive all the microbes around with us. And, yeah, water is really sterile. Water doesn't like to be sterile. Water actually makes life. So when you think about, though, that we can cope with a whole lot more um, variation in our environment than these primitive cells or than these other life forms, because, you know, we can go into space and we can go, um, you know, all over the world within our little technologies. And if we think about the extremes marking the level of adaptation, this is back to the slide you've seen before, with the bliss and the steady state zone, the adaptation zone, the breakdown zone, we can explore that breakdown zone with hot and cold. If I put you in an oven, you know, you're going to reach your panic zone pretty soon, <laughs> and eventually you know, you'll drop down. But you know, if I put you in a sauna, you can explore the edge of that, that heat. If I put you into an ice bath, you can explore the edge of your cold. But how often do we do that? You can do the same with acid and alkali. Just through simple breathing practices, you can go to the extreme of alkali or the extreme of acid. You can do the same with breathing practices just with, with hypoxia and oxygenation, or you can go to altitude and experience hypoxia. You can go hydration and dehydration, and you can go feasting and fasting. There's a lot of talk now about intermittent fasting. So we can explore the extremes of our glucose, our water, our oxygen, our carbon dioxide, and our temperature. Remember, they're the five elements? Now, these are the, that, this is the language of our cells. Every single cell in your body talks in the language of water, oxygen, carbon dioxide, temperature, and glucose. So when you're exploring the extremes of these, it's, what I, it's, a, it's a point where I say that your mitochondria talk to your mind, or your mind and your mitochondria are talking together. So you've breach this four and a half billion years of evolutionary history where your sophisticated mind is actually talking to these primitive prokaryotic cells that are even within our existing cells is our mitochondria. So I want to spend the rest of the, the evening is talking about how we can play with this consciously. Because at the moment, we, you know, we, we sort of do it subconsciously or we just go with the flow of life, but we can actually manipulate these things consciously. And when you know your limits, you can find your balance. So by exploring the limits out here, it lets you find the, the still point in the middle. Because if, if you don't really know where those, those limits are, that still point, you're sort of really not sure if you're there. You choose like this way or that way. Now, they're the cellular extremes. They're the five water, carbon dioxide, oxygen, temperature, and glucose. We can, we'll talk about playing with them. They're the cellular... This is a friend of mine, Simon 
Paul Galivia. Just had a like, photo of him up there. But um, there's all sorts of other extremes. Movement and stillness, activity, inactivity, exertion, relaxation, feasting, fast, intoxication, sobriety, and also social extremes, just connection and solitude, esteem and shame, certainty, wealth or poverty, helping or burdening you know, people. Now, these are more sophisticated extremes that we can all explore, but it's these basic extremes here that, that we're talking to ourselves. And when you pl play with those extremes, as I say, you can help find that middle point. And what happens is when you adapt to one stress, you get cross-adaptation to other areas of your life. So if, if you just play with, just if you just or pick temperature regulation, for example, if you play with regulating your temperature and coping with the stress of hot and cold, suddenly you can cope with the stress of all sorts of other stuff because you've improved your adaptive mechanisms. That's got a word, it's called hormesis. H-O-R-M-E-S-I-S. Hormesis means you've given yourself a stress. It's like exercise is hormetic. You're stressing yourself when you exercise, but by exercising, you've actually trained your adaptive processes to be better. So when stress that's out of your control comes, you can deal with it because you've, you've created stress that's within your control. And this is how our body reacts with homeostasis. You have a set point and you get this... Intensive response that pushes you off away from your set point and you dampen that down. And you have these oscillations that bring you back to the set point. And that's the process of negative feedback, which is what homeostasis is about. And there's all these different mechanisms for blood pressure and blood sugar and temperature and all these different things that are trying to get you back to this set point. Now, to get the ultimate set point means all those things have to be the same set point at the same time. That's the point of stillness. And it's actually achievable. Now, that's, they're the different parts of the nervous system. Again, this is really first principles. I'm not going to spend too much time. But the, you've got the sympathetic division and the parasympathetic division. So you've got the fight or flight or the rest and digest. And these basic activities, drinking, eating, breathing, regulating our temperature and doing stuff. And that's what I want to get down to because this is the stuff you're going to do today and tomorrow and the next day. So how can we change how we drink, eat, breathe, regulate our temperature and do stuff that helps us find our still point, helps us adapt to stress that we're we can be in control of, but then when stuff that we're out of control of, we can actually deal with. And this is, like, this is a, quite a strong idea, but tolerating discomfort enhances resilience, and then it enhances your experience of comfort. So I've got this little program that I'm, I'm actually developing this as a whole course. This is, you're going to get, you're going to get the, you know, the preview, pricey of this course, which I call Waking Up to Wellness, and it's, and it's about keeping your channels of elimination open and clear. And you know, you see, I like mnemonics and things, but you'll, so you've got five channels of elimination. They all start with B. Your bladder, your bowels, your breath, your body and your brain. And your bladder eliminates water and your bowel eliminates glucose and your breath, oxygen, and your body does temperature and your brain does carbon dioxide because that's what happens when you burn glucose, you build carbon dioxide. So I'm going to go through that sort of quickly and we'll see how well we go from there. So if you think talk about cleaning and clearing your bladder. So you want to filter and flush your body, and this is like really, you know, this is the flowing. Mind you, this all does relate to those five rhythms that I talked about before. So this is about water. You want to filter your body, or you want to filter the water you drink. I mean, if you're, you know, you want to have less toxicity in your body, you don't want to put it in. So drinking filtered water and flushing your body with lots of water, but also with herbal teas, things that will actually stimulate your liver and your kidneys to work better and excrete any toxicity that's built up. So drink plenty of water and herbal tea, and I'm a big fan of Tulsi, which I'll talk about in a minute, which is a uh, holy basil, which you can grow really well in Melbourne. You can buy it as tea bags. And you want to pass plenty of clear straw-coloured urine. And this is, you know, why do people die young? Well, modern society kills us. And in modern society is based on these three drinks, sugar, alcohol and caffeine. Every hotel room in the world, every cafe in the world, every aeroplane in the world you can get sugar, caffeine and alcohol. You're starting to get kombucha, I've noticed. You're starting to get kombucha. And kimchi. And kimchi, so it is starting, we'll talk about that. Um, but, you know, the caffeine fires us up, sugar will keep us going and alcohol will then bring us down. This, this is what drives Western civilization. And we're on this treadmill and it's, it's a toxic treadmill. So Tulsi is an alternative, but Tulsi 
actually has all the benefits of caffeine, sugar and alcohol without the drawbacks. So Tulsi actually relaxes you, but it um, doesn't give you the depressant effects of alcohol. Tulsi alert gives you an uh, alertness, but it doesn't make you agitated like caffeine. And Tulsi regulates your blood sugar, so it gives you energy, but doesn't give you the highs and lows that you get with a sugar drink. Um, so yeah, I recommend you know, drinking Tulsi, drinking other... I mean, I've got chamomile here, but drinking lots of filtered water, so you know, not low toxic water, and then keeping your body flushed. So our bowels. How do we, how do we keep our blouse flushed? Well, one is to fast for 12 hours before meals, so you know, fast every night. 12 hours, maybe 14 hours, sometimes 16 hours, depending on how, you know, within your comfort. This is exploring your comfort zone, but the edge of your comfort zone, and then realise that the feast is in the first bite. So every day you can have a feast because the first bite of the day is a feast and, you know, you fast it overnight. So it means not eating after maybe seven, eight at night and then you don't eat till maybe... 10, or, you know, the next day. It's not that hard, you know? And what you're doing, you're giving your body a rest. You're actually allowing your bowels to, to empty. And the other thing you can do is to support your microbiome, the gut bacteria. So you want to eat fibre, whole foods, and eat fermented foods. Kimchi, kombucha, pickles. Every culture has some form of fermented food traditionally. So that, that, what that does, it feeds our inner... Uh, micro, you remember those bacteria that we talked about? That you know, the gel cells, organelles. You know, they're in us. We need to we need to give them some, uh, you know, some proper food. This is the best probiotic. This bacteria, everything, candida, everything. That's it. If this you water. if you if you support your microbiome, mm. then your whole health changes, and this helps your bowels eliminate, um, keep keeps your channels of elimination open. It's, it's true. All of these things I'm going to talk about will help clear your mind. Yeah. But, but they will. And, and what they've, they've, there's research now that says that your microbiome actually control your, your moods. Yeah. Also, what, what you want to eat. Mm. So if you've got bad gut bacteria, they'll make you crave bad food. But if you've got good one, they'll actually... You won't want to eat bad food. You want to eat good food. So you have to train, mm. you know, be, you know, make, make peace with your microbiome and feed it fibre. That's a lot of insoluble fibre. You're not doing it for yourself, you're doing it for your gut. And in fact, even herbs now, like they're understanding like things like turmeric, you've probably heard of turmeric, it's good for inflammation. Well, turmeric's like three, you know, the curcumin in turmeric's like 3% bioavailable. But what, what they've found is that turmeric actually supports good bacteria and inhibits bad bacteria. So you don't even need it to be bioavailable because you're actually using the herbs just as much for your gut bacteria as you are for, your, for yourself. So this is how you can support your bowels. And your breath, well, there's you know, the five rhythms, the five types of breath, you know, flowing breath, panting breath, laughing, quiet and singing. So flowing, staccato, chaos, lyrical, literally when you're singing, and stillness, quiet breathing. So, I mean, you can do that every day. These are the types of breath you should be breathing every day. Now, breath control is a super powerful um, way to change how you think and your physiology. So it induces biochemical, biomechanical, psychological and symptomatic changes. You can also, it says, consciously access your ANS, your autonomic nervous system. You know, we had the parasympathetic and sympathetic nervous systems up. Well, your breath, normally it's, you've got this flowing breath, you're not in control of it. But if you take control of it, you can actually controlling all those, you know, the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous systems. So you can build self-confidence, you can line your body, breath and your brain, reduce pain, and inflammation, build up carbon dioxide and, and lactate tolerance, improve your mood and cognition. And, and again, Wim Hof, who's... People, people here, anyone heard of Wim Hof? OK, a third of people. So he's a Dutch man who discovered as a teenager that he could breathe a particular way and go into ice-cold water, and it, and it felt really good. And he's, you know, climbed Everest in his board shorts and run marathons in the Arctic Circle and done 26 world records of amazing feats using his training. And he, he's coming to Melbourne next month. I'll be giving lectures about the science behind the Wim Hof Method. And this is just some of the little... I thought I'd touch on that today. Um, so he does this hyperventilation, then a breath hold. And by doing that, you can change your, your pH 
by changing the carbon dioxide and you can change your oxygen levels. And we're not going to go into the details now because it's a bit technical. And in fact, this, I don't even think I'll go through this slide now. Although this will just go through the five phases of the Wim Hof method of breathing. So this is natural breathing, it's your flowing breath. Then you get this controlled hyperventilation, which is <sighs> If we had time, we could do it. You do it for two or three minutes, 30 or 40 breaths like that. That's staccato, backwards and forwards. And after two or three minutes, you get a bit high. You get a bit lightheaded and a bit dizzy. <laughs> and then you hold your breath. <gasps> and you'll find, after you've done two or three minutes of hyperventilation, you'll hold your breath for twice as long as you would normally because you've got rid of all your carbon dioxide and there's no drive to breathe. And then you do these recovery breaths, where you can just you know, breathe a lyrical breath, and then finally you'll find you do this peaceful breath where you can be actively doing nothing and you don't feel like breathing at all, because you're just in this blissed out phase. And that's the, the still phase. This is Wim Hof breathing. And what you'll find is with... I'll just, you know, I'm not going to go into the in-depth about this one, but at the end of the... <sighs> Know, the hyperventilation, you're a bit lightheaded. It's a bit dis uncomfortable. But you, you're in control of it. You get to decide when you want to stop doing it. So it's dysphoria. You know, you've heard of euphoria, it's when you feel good. Dysphoria is when you're feeling not good. But you've caused yourself to be dysphoric. And then you hold your breath. And then for a while, it's peaceful. And then at the end of the breath hold, you get a bit dysphoric again because you've gone the other way. You've gone from high oxygen and, and low carbon dioxide and you've swapped. Now you're high carbon dioxide, low oxygen. And again, you're dysphoric but you're in total control of it. You get to decide when you want to breathe again. And then you breathe again, and you have this lyrical return to physiological balance, and then you find this euphoria where your body is just in this still point where you don't feel like breathing at all, and, and your mind is totally at peace, and you're in this really still place. And that's the, the stillness, the, the, the fifth sort of rhythm of the Wim Hof. And then you go around and do another round. And you can really enjoy this, this still place, just from a breathing technique. I don't know if we're going to have time, otherwise we could have done some breathing. So this idea of dysphoria, you've got these two periods of dysphoria, and that actually causes this quite long period of euphoria. And that's this idea of, you know, you, you submit yourself to uncomf being uncomfortable, but you get to decide, you explore your limits of discomfort, and then you can f experience that point of comfort really strongly. Now, Michael, I'm going to talk briefly about this. So dynorphin is a, like, you might have heard of the endorphins. They get released when you're euphoric. They feel good. Dynorphin gets released when you feel bad. So but what dynorphin does, so at the end of, you know, when you're breathing and you're lightheaded and when you're holding your breath and you're, you're busting, that's, you get dynorphin released. But what dynorphin does, it increases the number and the sensitivity of endorphin receptors. So by feeling bad you're priming your body to feel good later on. <laughs> also, when you're, when you're doing this breathing, you become quite hypoxic. Your oxygen goes really low, just for a very short period. But by doing that, your mitochondria, which need oxygen to burn glucose, freak out. Because there's no oxygen. So they start burning anaerobically, they burn lactate, and that's what happens with intermittent um, high-intensity interval training. You know, you do... You know, you, you're trying to do anaerobic metabolism. But it also means that you're training your mitochondria to be really efficient. And any cells or any mitochondria that aren't efficient, maybe they've got proteins that aren't properly folded, maybe they're ageing, maybe they're precancerous, they don't survive. They get recycled. The body says, oh, no, you're not working, <laughs> fix you up. You know, we need to be really efficient to cope with this hypoxia. So it actually cleans up your cellular machinery. It's an actually anti-aging effect. Also releases erythropoietin, which is the, what the runners take to, you know, to be more effective, to make more red blood cells. But it's naturally doing that. And this is really fascinating. It mobilises stem cells. So like, the, like the holy grail of medicine is to be able to regenerate your own tissue. And the ability to do that is in your stem cells, which are hidden away in the middle of the bone marrow in what's called these hypoxic niches. Because... Stem cells don't like oxygen, so they're hidden away in these hypoxic niches. But when your whole body's hypoxic, they can start wandering around your whole body looking for things to do. And you can turn on your own regenerative medicine without you know, million-dollar stem cell transplants or anything. You're just turning that on within, with your own body. So these are some of the effects. 
and it stimulates apoptosis and autophagy. So apoptosis is the normal recycling of old cells, and autophagy is the recycling of cellular machinery, you know, proteins. Um, so aberrant ageing, um, precancerous cells, your body recognises them as that and then says, OK, you can, you're not going to do you're not helping, let's mop you up. So that's some of the... the you know, just, from, just for breathing. Um, so finally, you know, we've done bladder, we've done bowel, we've done breath. Now the body. Washing your hands is pretty basic, just washing, washing your whole body, but washing your hands, just exposure to germs, and then sweat, cleaning your body from the inside out. But what that also does is, if you sweat, you can, you're using your body's cooling system. Your body has an, has a heat, has a air conditioning system, it's also got a heating system. We don't use it very much. But if you make yourself sweat, you'll turn on your body's air conditioning system, you know, the, the, heat, you know, the cooling system, so you're actually cleaning your body from the inside out. And by exposing yourself to cold, you're turning on your body's thermostat, your, your heating mechanism. And what that does, anyone here got a thyroid problem? You don't have to admit it, but a lot of people in the West have thyroid problems and also metabolism problems because we're not kick-starting our metabolism. Or this, if you have a, a cold shower or an ice bath, for two hours afterwards, your metabolism is ramped up. So suddenly you're actually you're burning more glucose um, and you're training your, your body, you're actually working your metabolism. It's like a, a workout you can be doing driving to work or sitting on the couch because your metabolism is ramped up and you can just be sitting there. And finally, clean and clear your brain. And by that I mean do nothing and do everything. So doing nothing, so, which means actively doing nothing. And you may think you're doing nothing, but there's always less you can do. So how can you do less? <laughs> so meditating, but even meditating, how do you do less? Like, like I find like if I do Wim Hof Method breathing, when I'm in that peaceful breathing phase, my pulse rate will go 10 beats per minute below my resting pulse. My resting pulse is 55. I can get my pulse down to 40 after doing this breathing technique. So that's doing even less. And then how do I do even less? And I'll, I'll share with you how you can even do less than that. But there are ways you can hack your body to do as little as possible. And then you want to have periods where you're doing everything possible, where you're in the flow, where you're totally engaged, so your mind and your body, are, you're doing every, every single thing possible. Um, and we talked about flow already. So you know, how do you, you know, find what's flow for you and have periods in your day when you're totally engaged with what, what's going on, totally engaged with life. And the way, I think, to do that is to give thanks to actually activate your heart and your, and your mind. And thank you, Brooke. Um, by, by giving gratitude for everything. So it means you're engaging your mind with everything that's going on. And then you're connecting. So giving and receiving, making that connection. So this is a very simple lifestyle, lifestyle prescription. These five elements. This is just part of a whole prescription. So it's you know, your bladder, your bowels, your breath, your body and your brain. This is the language of your cells. So you filter and flush, feast and fast, pant and hold, do hot and cold, and then do and don't. These are things you can do every day. They're pretty simple things to do. And, I mean, the panting and holding, that's probably the most dramatic of the breathing exercises, but, I mean, just getting an activity where you're panting, maybe just climbing the stairs or going for a run or doing something where you... <sighs> I mean, you can do the Wim Hof breathing where you're sitting down and consciously deciding to <sighs> you know, hyperventilate. But you can, you know, there's a lot of different ways to make yourself pant. You know, there's many ways to make yourself hold your breath. But having periods where you're doing these extremes can be really helpful to make you find your balance. And I, I call this extreme wellness training. And you don't have to be a daredevil. You don't have to want to climb Kilimanjaro in your board shorts like I'm going to be doing with my sons in September with Wim. But, you know, all you're doing is you're pursuing extreme comfort and stillness. That's, that's the aim. How can I get extreme comfort and stillness? But how can I do it by tolerating discomfort? How willing am I to tolerate discomfort? How willing am I to stay in that sauna until it's really hot? How willing am I to go into a cold shower and just having a cold shower and feeling cold? How willing am I to, you know, fast for 12 or 14 hours and, and really get in touch with my hunger? Um, so these are, you know, so you can, you can do it safely, there's no effort, but you want to be mindful of your own mind. So how comfortable are you with discomfort? And this is discomfort that you're in control of. 
So when there's discomfort that comes that you're not in control of, your body's primed. Your body knows what to do. Your body is not an unusual thing. You say, OK, I, you know, I can be just uncomfortable. So this, this brings me back to how do you can be as comfortable as possible. And this is water immersion, getting back to water. When you're in water, you can actually be more relaxed than you can be in air. And we're doing research on this at the moment, because and, and there's, I could spend another half hour talking about the physiology of water immersion. But the water actually has hydrostatic pressure. It puts pressure on, on your limbs, so it actually pushes the blood from your limbs into your, into your thorax. So it makes your heart do more work, but your heart is actually more relaxed. And by doing that, by pushing the blood from your limbs into your thorax, it's pushing blood through your organs, through your liver and your kidneys, which is flushing um, all the, the blood through your body. So it's actually stimulating the detoxification of the liver and kidneys. Um, and it's actually physiologically relaxing you. So you can actually be more relaxed and, and you're weightless. So you've got this weightless effect, so all, all these different effects. And then it depends on the temperature of the water. If it's thermoneutral, you can be totally relaxed. And then you, know, you put some minerals in there and, and you get this incredible relaxation. So that's where you can find that, that stillness. But then with bathing, you can also find the extremes. So you can go into a hot spring, hot bath, and, and really pump it up, and, or a sauna bath, so you're really feeling the heat. Or you can go into an ice bath or a cryotherapy unit. And, you know, I think that's me there at minus 140, um, which is cold. Or you can go into an ice bath, and you can ex experience the stream of cold. So... You can, you can explore those, that ex, that ex, and it's up to you how long you want to stay in each of these. Again, you're in control, but you can explore hot and cold, and then you can find that absolute middle relaxation. So this is, you know, and you know, I want to talk a little bit about cold. I think we've got a bit more time. Um, you might have seen some cryo saunas are opening up all over the world now. You know, talking about anti-aging weight loss, and flushing toxins, and boosting metabolism. Um, relieving pain, releasing endor increasing endorphins, muscle repair, and a lot of athletes have been doing this for years. And now cold, you know, you pay $80 for three minutes in a cry sauna, but you don't need a cry sauna. You, you've got a shower at home? Just turn the hot water off and the cold water on. I want to share some of that with you. <laughs> and the benefits of cold exposure, so it's actually a forced mindfulness practice. It forces you to be mindful when you're in cold water. And in fact, it's a force of willpower because the hardest thing about cold water immersion is the decision to do it. You know, at your edge of the pool, and you know, you know, you want to jump in the pool, and the pool is cold. The hardest thing is just deciding to jump in, and sometimes you need someone else to push you because you're just not going to do it yourself. But once you're in, okay, I'm, I'm in. It's okay. Maybe it's cold. It's okay, but I'm not going to die. I mean, so but it is a forced mindfulness, reduces pain, it exercises your blood vessels and your lymphatics. We talked about the autonomic nervous system. You've got 100,000 kilometres of blood vessels in your body. They're all lined by muscle. But that's not muscle you can control. It's not muscle you can consciously exercise. But you can force that muscle to exercise by going to a hot, which opens those muscles, and then going to cold, which closes them. So by controlling your external environment, you can control the vascular muscles of 100,000 kilometres. And what do most people die of? Well, it used to be vascular disease, now it's cancer. But vascular disease is still number two. So if you want to exercise your vascular system, just hot and cold will do it. So cold showers can actually make you happy. But when I talk to people like, you know, I've talked to a lot of groups like this, I say, who takes cold showers every day? Who, who here takes cold showers every day? Yeah, I thought it was about one in ten. Or it might be, might be you know, two or three in ten. Most people don't. Because cold showers aren't so much fun. You know, they can make you happy, but, you know, they're a bit daunting for some people. So I, so I wrote a song and I created a dance that I'm going to teach you all <laughs> to help you have cold showers. It's called the Cold Shower Hokey Pokey. <laughs> and the way to do it, and I want you to all do this tomorrow morning. In fact, maybe I'll get you all to stand up because you're going to do it with me. So imagine you're in a hot shower and it's really hot. Okay, or maybe it's just comfortable. So you've soaked up, you've rinsed off, the, the shower's really hot, and then you turn it a little bit hotter. So it's getting uncomfortably hot. And then once it's uncomfortably hot and you think it's so hot I've got to get out, you stand back and you turn, turn with me, you turn the hot water off, turn the cold water on, and then you just wet your left foot and leg. 
and then your right foot and leg, and then your left hand and arm, and your other hand and arm. And then you keep breathing calmly and smile to yourself, because that's what it's all about. And what you've done then is you've pushed... When you, when you had the hot shower, you were really vasodilated, yeah? All your blood vessels are really open, you're really hot. But by doing the cold on your feet and your legs, you're pushing blood from your, li from your limbs up and from your outside in. So suddenly all this extra warm blood's now in your torso. And even though your limbs are cold, your, your torso feels really warm, so you're not uncomfortable yet. <laughs> but then you keep breathing calmly, you're smart, you're and then you put your left side in, come on, left side in, then your right side in, and then your front side in, and you turn yourself around. <laughs> and, then, and then you keep on breathing calmly and you smile to yourself, because that's what it's all about. And then if you're up for it, you put your whole head in, <laughs> you move your whole head around, you just stand still and feel the drenching, and then you slowly turn yourself around. Continue breathing calmly and smile to yourself, because that's what it's all about. And then you freestyle. And you go, oh, hokey pokey, and you do your armpits. <laughs> oh, hokey pokey, you do your groin. <laughs> oh, hokey pokey, you do your kidneys. And then you can stay as long as you want. But that takes, oh, that takes about a minute and a half. You can sit down now. Thank you for doing that with me. You do a cold shower. Yeah, so, so what you find is cold water takes your breath away. And what you need to do is take control back over your breath. And that's why you keep breathing calmly and smile to yourself. It's really important between the verses. Because you, you don't want to traumatise yourself. Although holding your breath is, has benefits, yeah? But this, this is, if you do the cold water hokey pokey, it's very, very easy to have a cold shower. <laughs> It makes it, it's not traumatic. I mean, to have a cold shower just straight away can be like, oh my God, you know. But to do this, just your legs, just your arms, maybe just do that for a week, just legs and arms, and then work up the next week, do your body, and then the next week, do your head. But what you'll find is our bodies are evolutionarily adapted to cold. So you adapt very, very quickly. So even after, you know, a few days of doing cold shower, the next day it's so much easier, and the next day it's even easier again. So you'll find you can actually end up having a cold shower. Mind you, in summer now in Melbourne, it's 18 degrees of water temperature in your shower. It's not that cold. In winter, that was 8 degrees last winter in Melbourne, so it's a lot colder. Um, but you can play with that. But, so just doing hot and cold shower, in fact, I don't know if you know, but that's what James Bond does every day. <laughs> well, James Bond's not a real person, he's fictional, yeah? But Ian Fleming, when he wrote the James Bond series, he, he wrote that James Bond has what's called a Scotch shower, because he had Scottish heritage, and a Scotch shower is hot shower followed by a cold shower. And what it does, it makes you feel ready for the day. It makes you feel tingly and alive, and you get out of the shower, and you feel really good. And the other thing is, it makes you give this sense of self-efficacy. Like, I can do stuff. Like, you know, if there's uncomfortable stuff for me to do in life, I can do it, because I had a cold shower. You know? and, and you actually you actually build up this sense of hey I can do stuff. So that's you know, that's just a really simple little practice. Oh, there's quite a whole lot of practices we've gone through, but now I want to go a bit more global and talk about bathing. As you know, we talked about water as being this you know thing that connects all human life or all, all life on Earth, not just human life. So bathing connects us to the Earth's water, which connects us to all living things on Earth, and that bathing is fun. Pleasurable, social, peaceful, multicultural, multi generational. It links diverse cultural, religious, spiritual traditions, and it plays a critical role in good health, dignity, confidence, and comfort. And, in, and I've made bathing a central focus of my research now because bathing is the, and this comes, when I tell people this, they're really surprised. Bathing is the single most potent health intervention on earth. You know, that's, people don't realise that. I'll say it again, bathing is the single most potent health intervention on Earth, and that's because, at the moment, one in three people on Earth can't bathe. 2.4 billion people, one in three people, don't have access to bathing water. And if you think about bathing, it's not just, you know, about you know, washing and feeling good, it's, it's about basic hygiene. So if you, you know, sanitary practices, washing the body, face and hair, 
with hand washing cleansing after toileting menstruation play a vital role in preventing and controlling disease. But if you think of one in three people can't wash off their menstrual blood, their urine and their faeces. You know, we can't, you know, we talked about illness and wellness. Illness is about I, wellness is about we. We're not going to be well in the world until everyone can bathe. We've got, one in, we've got a third of the world who don't wash. They can't even feel human. I mean, just to not smell and, and to feel good about yourself and, you know, to feel comfort. This is a really basic human need. So I'm on this mission to bathe the world now. Um, and can we bathe the world? You know, it offers global health benefits beyond any pharmaceutical, any vaccine, any medical intervention. Just bathing has more potential to help people have good health than anything else you can think of. And if you think about access to water, about a billion people don't have access to drinking water, 2.4 billion don't have access to bathing water, and about 1,000 children die every day from waterborne disease. Every day, mainly women and girls spend 200 million hours every single day just to collect water. So you think what, they, what else they could spend that time with. 200 million hours, I mean, that's, that's a lot of human productivity just to collect water. So we've got a campaign to give everyone on Earth a bucket a day, 10 litres a day. That's enough for, you know, to drink and have a bucket bath. I think in Melbourne, most people use about 200 litres a day. They're trying to keep us down to 150 when we have water shortages, yeah? But at the moment, you know, as I say, a, th one in th you know, a third of the world don't even have a bucket a day. Um, so we've got a campaign at the moment um, to create, we've created a foundation called Bathe the World Foundation. Um, we're petitioning the United Nations to create World Bathing Day, which they haven't done yet. I mean, there's World Toilet Day, there's World Water Day, but no World Bathing Day. We've got a campaign to add a dollar to hotel bills. So when you buy a hotel room with a bath, you can give a dollar to someone who can't bathe. And in fact, we're working with a, a Melbourne-based company um, called F-Cubed. Thank you, Brooke. Um, who put me in contact with them. But they have a, a solar technology where they have a, um, solar panels that you can put salt water in from the, the ocean. And at the other end, you get distilled fresh water and bath salt, magnesium salts. And that magnesium salt, we can sell in hotels and give people a nice bath in the hotel, and then that money that they spend on the bath salt goes back to give more water to more people, and we can spread bathing. And then finally, we're doing an event in 2020 in the world's biggest hot spring. And the world's biggest hot spring happens to be in the dead centre of Australia. So literally, if you put your finger in the centre of a map of Australia, it'll be on Dalhousie Springs which is on the edge of the Simpson Desert in the middle of nowhere. Literally in the middle of nowhere. There's these big lakes of hot water, 17,000 litres of hot water per second come out of the ground. It's the world's biggest hot spring. So we're having an event where we're going to bring a representative from every nation on Earth to Dalhousie, and we're going to literally, or figuratively, bathe the world, um, hosted by the world's oldest living culture, the Aboriginal culture from Central Australia, in the remotest location on the driest continent at the world's biggest hot spring, we're going to vision a world where everyone can enjoy bathing, where everyone can just be clean and, and well. So I can invite you all there in 2020. So we've got a couple of years to prepare for that. So this is like, yeah, Bathe the World event that we're creating. And you know, what we're trying to do is we're trying to, to literally imagine a world of wellness, you know, to realise worldwide wellness. And we're not going to do that until we can, you know, the we, you know, everybody's healthy and everyone's not going to be healthy and well until they can bathe. But then, even if you do bathe, and this is a strong message, you can transform your own physiology and your own consciousness by playing with the hot water tap and the cold water tap. <laughs> going to a sauna. And then if you're really serious, you can go to an ice bath. And, you know, it sounds a bit dramatic. I mean, I thought it was, and, you know, I've now bought an ice machine for my bathroom so I can put 50 kilos of ice in the bath and have an ice bath, you know, at home. And then I'm looking forward to winter when my swimming pool will drop down to eight degrees again and I can just go and stand in my swimming pool in the morning, which I was doing in July and August last year, until, the, you know, by September, October, the water in the swimming pool had risen again, so I had to buy the ice machine. But you can really... I, it's, it's quite amazing how adaptive we are to cold, but we just don't let ourselves do it. And you can talk to the icebreakers, you know, the people down in Brighton and Black Rock, you know, in their 70s and 80s, and they're swimming every day in the ocean all, the, all year round, and they've done research on those sort of people, they don't get sick. They have incredible physiology, they, you know, they're really healthy. And it's, 
as I say, we've wrapped ourselves up in this comfort zone. So we're in this sort of comfort zone in the middle there where there's a whole lot of mush. We've never really found the perfect point of stillness, but we haven't found the edge of our extremes either. And by consciously exploring those extremes, whether it's by feasting and fasting, or if you don't like cold, try it with the hot. Do a sauna or a steam room. And then, then do the cold, and then do the cold water hockey pie, and you'd be happy just to do your legs and your arms, and you can just, just explore your own comfort zone or the edge of your comfort zone, and you'll find by, by not pushing it too hard, just by, by exploring it, it naturally expands by itself. And as your comfort zone expands, so does your resilience to all these other stresses that life's going to throw at you. Ageing and disease and social, all these other social stresses, suddenly you know, you're, you're coping with them. So that's, I think we're over time now. I'm really happy to take questions. I know some people have to leave. Um, hopefully that was useful, interesting, and please do, the, do, do you know, have, have a shower, turn the cold on. Yeah? Wim Hof, W-I-M-H-O-F. And he's got some online videos. There's a free course that he explains the breathing. Um, Wim, W-I-M-H-O-F. And where is he talking? Um, he's speaking, he's coming to Melbourne on the 14th of March at the Docklands. Maybe on your website? I put it on Facebook, yeah. Yeah, I put it on my Facebook. Otherwise, if you Google Wim Hof Australia, they'll have... Um, yeah, oh, not my profile, but it's, oh, it's probably down my. Yeah, so I I'll, 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 I'll post it again on my thing because I'm speaking at his four events. He's got two in the Gold Coast, one in Sydney, and one in Melbourne. And you gonna have some seminars next month, or yourself? Am I giving seminars? Um, I'm giving four seminars with the Wim Hof tour, and then um. Very much like, I mean, not really. I'm, I'll, I'll be speaking at the Byron Spirit Festival in April, Byron Bay. And I don't know if I'm giving any other lectures. I'm, I'm sort of turning myself down a little bit um, to do more research. But I've got a lot of lectures, and th I think these lectures get put online. So I've got lots more stuff online. And, and I'm actually building a course based on, ba based on this, you know, the Waking Up to Wellness. I'm building a whole online course. that, that I mean, today I, I covered a lot of the, the basics, and that'll go more into details about this and some practices. But, but hopefully today you've all got some little tips you can, you can actually do. Thank you yeah. very much for your very fine, wonderful talk. Thank There's you. Two things I want to say. With panting and holding and breath, yes. and with the heart and koshas, I've been told that it's not healthy for people who've got heart problems because it's too stimulating. Um, that, there's a lot of um, debate about that. And if you look at the cold water literature, they talk about sudden cardiac death when you go into cold water. But they're talking about people who have fallen in the North Sea off the edge of a boat and who are brittle cardiac pa patients anyway. So, and what I'll say in generally is use yourself as a barometer and you don't do anything extreme. So start really gentle. And so, so that's what I'm saying. Do the cold water hokey pokey. Just start with you know your legs and if, and your arms. And if that's if that's already feeling enough, just st stay with that for a while and then expand. So don't. I wouldn't say to anyone go straight into an ice bath for five minutes. You know, but um, for most people, it's incredibly safe. Um, so I mean, if you've got a brittle cardiac arrhythmia, you are playing with your autonomic nervous system doing these things. So you can. You know, make your heart go slower or faster, and even wa water immersion will change the way your heart beats because of the extra the way blood's flowing. But generally, you know, these things are incredibly safe. But you need to be your own barometer, and th this is one of the important principles to get in touch with your own body. How comfortable are you? And it's very unlike uh, unless you're going to throw yourself into an extreme situation suddenly then you can bring on some, maybe, an arrhythmia if you've got a, you know, a brittle heart. Again, it's, it's really safe as long as you're doing what's comfortable for you. So, to, I mean, to pant, after, you know, 30 breaths, you'll get a bit lightheaded. Then you stop and you hold your breath and you'll see how comfortable you are with the breath hold 
and then when you feel like you can, you take a breath. Um, that's, that's very unlikely to cause... Cardi the, the cold will be more... In fact, in the emergency department, when I was working, you know, at the Alfred, you know, just around the corner here, um, when people come with ventricular tachycardia in their heart, one of the things you do, you put their face in ice water. And actually, you stabilise. That's, that's a, a way to contact, you know, connect with the parasympathetic nervous system and actually change the heartbeat using ice water in a positive way. So, I mean, again, I mean, all of these things, it's like, you know, you wouldn't tell anyone to run a marathon if they're not trained. It's the same principle. You know, you, you start, jet, you know, you train up and work up to it. Um, I, I was amazed with my kids, you know, I've got two teenage boys and, um, you know, the first time they had an ice bath, it was like a minute or two minutes and they freaked out. And then the next very next day, they doubled their time. And the next day, they went even longer. Um, because your body adapts very, very quickly. And in, if you think about, um, you know, especially, I mean, Europeans, but even it, it, there's great stories about in North America, how when, they, when the settlers first came to Boston in North America, the, the Native American Indians were walk, walking around in loincloths in Boston winter. You know, minus 25 degrees, and they, they were adapted to the cold. And our European ancestors, you know, when it gets cold in Europe, what happens each day gets a little bit colder, so your body adapts very quickly. So if you train your body to have a little bit more cold today than yesterday, your body says, hey, winter's coming, and we didn't even talk about brown adipose tissue, brown fat. So brown fat is, is white fat that has super amounts of mitochondria. And mitochondria, these, you know, what makes heat, you know, you saw that mitochondrial um, equation. And the brown fat is only around your blood vessels. So imagine if you had a heater coil around your heart and your big blood vessels. That's what brown fat does. And brown fat is designed to make heat. And the most efficient fuel for making heat is fat, white fat, the stuff you carry here. Now, if you're, if you're going for a run, you won't burn fat, you'll burn glucose, then you'll burn glycogen, then you'll start burning muscle before your body burns white fat, because you, white fat's a really valuable resource. But it's really, really, because it's so high dense in energy, it's the best form for making heat. So if your body wants to, you know, I said work out your, thermos, your thermostat, turn on your heating system, the fuel for your body's heating system is white fat. So you actually end up burning white fat using your brown fat. So that's actually a really positive thing. But again, Use yourself as your own barometer. Be, you know, make sure you know, you're within your own comfort zone, but you're at the edge of your comfort zone. You're not gonna be, if, you're, if you're always warm and comfortable and you're never you know, hot or cold, you're not going to be able to push your... You know, explore that, those edges. But it's your edges, so you need to know where they are. I can't tell you what's going to be right for you. But it, but it, but it is incredibly safe. It's, um, you know, not, as long as you don't fall in the North Sea and you know, have, have a cold shock. Well, can it be really good for vascular problems? Again, you're ex exercising your vascular system. But, but I mean, depend, everyone's different depending on which vascular problems you have. But even... Um, and some people with Raynaud's disease, yeah. which is, you know, they get very constricted in cold, so cold can be a problem for them. But if they go from hot to cold and they, they're training their vascular system to open and close, it's like, you know, training your muscles to, to work. Well, well, you can't consciously do that for your blood vessels, but you can do it with hot and cold. So it's like you're, you're a personal trainer for your blood vessels. Sorry. Yep. Could I, um, Sorry? Just before, not to cut off questions, but yep. maybe if I could just do a thank you so that oh, sure. anyone who would, who's okay. needing to leave can do so. Um, on behalf of Spirit Grow and everyone who's been here, thank you so much. Um, oh, pleasure. I know that you've opened my mind and I'm thank sure you. for other people as well. <laughs> So I'm happy to take a few more questions, yeah. Well, thank you very much for all this knowledge you've given us. Um, I'm very interested in biohacking, and so right now I'm following a uh, ketogenic diet called the intermittent fasting, and so you mentioned the fact of uh, burning glucose. So what's, what happens then if you just burn fat instead of glucose? Well, you're doing the, you know, the feasting and the fasting, you're doing the fasting. I'm doing the fasting and I am into ketosis. Mm -hmm. so I, I don't use any sugar yeah. uh, from carbs, and also I don't know if you're aware of the bulletproof diets, which yeah. is uh, basically using coffee, but you know organic coffee beans and uh, uh, 
simple object. So mm -hmm. I would just want to have your insight because it can be actually healthy to have healthy. Abs absolutely. What, well, what I would suggest, I mean, I like to do polarities. So I like to be balanced. So I like to, to go one string and the other string and then find the middle point. And I find with the ketogenic diet, you're doing this point, but you're not doing that side as well. So I, I mean, so it can be really useful. It's great for weight loss and it's great for certain, you know, for athletes. But I don't know that I'd want to live on it, like as a permanent way to, way to eat. And, you know, to go have a feast every now and then, you know, and then go back to, to fast. So that's why intermittent fasting I, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm a fan of. But you're intermittent fasting, but then when you're eating, you're actually only eating fats and... Well, uh, so, I'm following the bulletproof diet, and if you know it, but you actually have one day during the week which is only carbs. So then you are doing the feast. That's your carb feast, and then you're going back to... So, so I mean, I think... And, again, you're the barometer, so if it works for you, I think that's great. But, but I think that's, that is a good thing. So you're doing, you know, the feasting and the fasting. I wouldn't say just do fasting without the feasting. I wouldn't say, you know, do, just do the hot without the cold. Um, and it's interesting because we've just, we've just um, written up, one of my PhD students and I have written up a, a review of all the sauna studies, all the sauna research, and we've just done a big sauna research ourselves. But there's evidence now that the more you sauna, and this is done in Finland, there was reduced all-cause mortality, reduced cardiovascular events, reduced Alzheimer's disease, and reduced respiratory problems. With saunering, the more you sauna, you had the less of all those problems. But one of the things in Finland, when they go into... And sauna is a Finnish word. It's the only Finnish word in the English language. And now pretty much every five-star hotel and every sports centre has a sauna, yeah? Every gym. But in Finland, when they have a sauna, after the sauna, they go outside and they jump in the snow or they jump in the river or they jump in the, in the lake. And they come back in the sauna and they do usually two or three times. So cold is a natural part of the sauna experience that they take for granted in Finland because it's outside their door, but the rest of the world hasn't taken along with it. So we have saunas in a gym or, you know, you go to a hotel in Singapore and, you know, there'll be a sauna there, but there won't be the ice bath. And, you know, I'm, I'm trying to remedy that, saying, hey, you know, if you're going to do hot, do cold. So if you're going to vasodilate, then vasoconstrict as well. So you're doing both. And it's only by doing both that then you can find that really sweet spot where you can do nothing. And, you know, and again, with, whether it's feasting or fasting or hot and cold, you know, explore those boundaries, but also make a conscious effort to explore that point of actually doing nothing. Have a bath and just relax and just, you know, just be really comfortable. You know, when you've done your breathing, you know, experience that point where you're just blissful and you don't have to breathe and you're just sort of quiet and, and you're feeling... You know, this stillness, this, you know, this point of, is a nice place to end, the point of stillness between your wellness and, and illness. And by cultivating that stillness, that pure water that's in you, um, you know, that then is an anti-ageing mechanism, it's a happiness mechanism, it's, it's connecting you to all, all life. It's, it's actually a spiritual experience as well as a physical, psychological experience. Yeah, that's the last one. For those who don't have bathtubs, I was wondering if you have a hot shower and you use an ice bucket uh, with water just through the feet, would that be? Yeah, I mean, if you've got a hot shower, just have a cold shower. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You just want to go that one step further. Yeah, so, and this, is a, and this is an issue because in Melbourne, like, and a lot of places in the world, the, the cold water is not that cold. So, it just, although I, I, we've been doing some research with um, Formula One racing drivers, and they they overheat. I mean, it gets 50 degrees centigrade in a Formula One car, especially in you know, Dubai or Singapore Grand Prix or something. Um, and what they do is, before they go race, they just go into, like, 26-degree water. So it's not even freezing water. But if you spend, you know, 20 minutes, it'll bring your body temperature down. So cold water doesn't have to be freezing to get a cold effect. Even 18-degree shower water, if you're under there for five minutes, it'll bring your body temperature down and you'll get the same cooling effect. It just takes a bit longer. A nice bath will take two minutes, a cold shower will take five. Yeah? Uh, I live in Manchester and a couple of years ago they refurbished the swimming pool where I go regularly and did away with the cold shower. Mm -hmm. um, so now it's just all the showers all come the same temperature and I've been having a go at them every time I go in there and say, why can't you put a cold shower back? 
Yeah, I've got, I've got a campaign now for spas and gyms and resorts to actually not just put in cold showers and put in ice spas and ice showers. And in fact, the, a, to imagine, it's pretty cold, must I imagine so. But um, <laughs> a good friend of mine owns a Peninsula Hot Springs. And in, I think, June, July this year, they're opening up an extreme bathing zone where they have these two big 30 people saunas. Then they're going to have a, like a big chilled pool at you know, 12 degrees, which is still, 12 degrees is still really cold. And then they're going to have an ice bath or an ice pool that's going to, after five minutes, it'll freeze over. So you'll have your own personal breakthrough to get in it. You have to break the ice to actually get in it. Um, so they're opening up that. And I think that's going to be, I think you're going to see more and more. Cold has become trendy in the sort of the health wellness space. So these cryo saunas where you pay a lot of money for liquid nitrogen cooled air, um, which is great. But again, you know, just a little bit longer in a cold shower doesn't cost you, you know, cost you nothing really. And a lot of these practices I'm talking about, you know, whether it's, you know, breathing or, um, you know, filtering your water and, and having a hot cold shower, it's sort of stuff you do anyway. It doesn't take extra time. You don't need any products. It's not like you have to go to the gym to do it. It's just you can make it part of your day. And that's, you know, I think, you know, the best health routines are things that's easy to do that you're actually going to do and they're practical to do. Um, rather than you have to go somewhere and pay to go to a cryo sauna or you have to go to a gym and work out. Well, you can work out lying in... If you do the breathing technique, you can literally do it lying in bed um, or sitting on a chair. You know, the hot, cold shower, you just do it in your shower. So, yeah, if you don't have... I mean, you can you can just do your limbs. I mean, you can do your head. But um, just five or you know, five, six more you know, minutes or just a bit longer, you know, just a cold shower, especially doing your groin, your armpits and your kidneys because that's where your blood vessels come close to the surface. So you're cooling them, you're cooling up, cooling the blood in the back of your knees as well. Um, you can get your body temperature quite down. And you'll, you'll find you'll, for about two or three hours, you'll, you'll feel a bit tingly. I, I, I must share because I've always been a hot water guy. I've always been a bathing guy. I've loved bathing my whole life. But it was, what, two years ago, I was with my mum on this trip. After, after, it was after the world, the conference on the, water, the physics, chemistry and biology of water. And we went to a, a, a place in Austria, the Aquadome, which is this five-star hot spring resort. And had this shower experience there. Where it was a big room, it was like two-metre diameter, and had this shower there. Where you could press one button, you got a warm shower. And you press another button, you got this sort of rainforest lightning and thunder. And you press the third button, and you got 320 litres of ice water coming from six metres high on your head in, in five seconds. And it felt like 20 seconds. So, like, you're there, and, like, it was, like, five seconds of, like, 320 litres, like, two, you know, two bathtubs full of water dumping on your head. And I did that, and you end up with an ice cream headache, yeah? And it's, like, strong and freezing. And for about three hours after, I was, like, buzzing, like I'd had, I don't know, like... You know, colours were brighter, you know, the whole <laughs> body's tingling. It's like, my God, your whole body's just woken up. Um, and that, that was just before I met Wim Hof. Um, and you know, I haven't looked back since then. But that was like, it was a real wake-up experience for me, you know, literally and figuratively, you know, having this cold water dump and realising, wow, cold is so powerful. And it felt amazing. Like, it felt really good. But it was like really short period of time, like 320 litres and then... For hours afterwards, you felt amazing. So if you're doing it at a warmer temperature, you still get the same. You can get a similar effect, which just takes longer. And and if it's uncomfortable, you know you're uncomfortable for longer. <laughs> Whereas in an ice bath, you know three or four or five minutes in an ice bath, and I'm good for the next couple of hours. Well, if you're training yourself, you, you, in fact, I was surprised because Austria is really strict with regulations. You know, it's one of those, you know, Western countries that are super strict with all, you know, public health. And this was a cold shower experience that was super severe, but there was no warning. There was no lifeguard there. There was no attendant. It was just a shower experience. You could just press a button and have this intense cold shower. And it wasn't even labelled, you know. It was like there were three <laughs> buttons. And it was like, which button am I going to press? Oh, let's see, what does this button do? Ah! <laughs> you know? So, I mean, they must have had... And this was a, you know, a luxury... Resort, so I was quite surprised. That it must, I mean, obviously they haven't, and this was a place where a lot of elderly people go as well. So I'm, you know, they obviously haven't had anyone drop dead there. <laughs> I assume, <laughs> mind you, I came alive there literally. <laughs> it was really quite powerful. We probably better wrap it up. I think. 
Um, okay, so yeah, that, 10 o'clock we're... Yeah, we're, not no. to put a dampener on it with all the moisture. But, uh, <laughs> but, uh, Thanks, but, David. Uh, <laughs> thank you, every, everyone, very much for coming and feel free to, to have a bite to eat up the back there and ask Mark any other questions. 